We have um, completed our study on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, but tonight I want to uh, talk about an area that is very much connected to uh, what we've been studying uh, in a very practical way uh, tonight, uh, ministering in the Spirit, especially as we pray for one another. Uh, I want us to think about that together uh, tonight. So if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of James chapter 5, uh, we'll begin there. James chapter 5. This is a familiar passage um, and uh, is a very profound, very deep uh, passage. It says, at verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, there are a lot of ways that we can approach this passage of Scripture. It, like I said, it's, it's really profound. There's a lot of, lot of ideas and questions and issues in this particular passage of Scripture. Unconfessed sin as a cause for sickness. The ministry of elders in healing. Uh, the use of oil in healing. Uh, why do Christians suffer? What is the prayer of faith? Uh, the connection between forgiveness and healing. I mean, there, is so, there are so many issues wrapped up in these few verses uh, of James that we could literally do a series that could take months to, to just unpack everything that James has just said to us. Powerful and very important. Now, the essence, though, is what I want to focus on tonight, and I want us to, to really apply some of the things that we've been learning in regards to the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and, and ministering in the Spirit. And uh, the essence of this passage, whoops, or what James is saying through all of this is that prayer works. Prayer works, pray for one another. <laughs> That's pretty simple. Prayer works, pray for one another. And uh, prayer opens the door for gifts of healings, it opens the door for deliverance, uh, for miracles, for the forgiveness of sins, uh, for breaking generational curses, for breaking cycles of dysfunction in relationships. God does so much of his work through prayer. And so James is exhorting us to, to pray for one another and, and to take it seriously because God does work through that, through prayer. As a people of the Spirit, We've been, we've been given the, the gifts of the Spirit and the way that many of those gifts are released and the way that many of those gifts are meant to operate is through the, the vehicle of prayer and the work of prayer. Pray for one another. Uh, and we don't do near enough of that, I don't think, uh, in, in, the, in the way that, that perhaps we could. And, and it's been on my heart to just talk about uh, how we go about praying for one another. You know, we, in our Christianese, uh, the, the kind of the, the greeting that we use, it's almost like a greeting, I'll oh, pray for you. Hey, how you doing? i oh, praying for you. you know, but it doesn't mean anything. It's just a way to acknowledge someone's, you know, a friend or, you know, express, but it really doesn't go very far. And, and James, if nothing else, his whole book, uh, is a book about getting real. <laughs> it's a book about let's take this stuff seriously. From chapter 1 through chapter 5, he really deals with the realities of walking with God. And, and here he is talking about prayer, and I want to talk about prayer tonight. 
uh, and especially praying for people, ministering in the Spirit, praying for people. Um, in most churches, there are usually kind of two approaches that are taken with prayer. Uh, and you can kind of like them, liken them to two different kinds of guns. <laughs> uh, one gun works pretty well, and the other gun, not so well. The one that doesn't work so well is the shotgun, <laughs> shotgun prayers. And how many have heard shotgun prayers or prayed shotgun prayers? We all, we all have. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, someone comes to you after maybe a small group meeting or maybe you're up here at, and, and someone says, hey, could you, you pray for me? And, uh, uh, you know, the prayers are kind of funny. They go something like, uh, uh, oh, Lord, bless my brother. And Lord Jesus, just bless his kids. And Lord, bless his wife and his neighbors and give him traveling mercies today. And, and Jesus, just put angels all over him, oh, God. And, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we pray for health and happiness. And Lord, just you know his needs better than we know his needs and better than he knows his needs. And so, Lord, just take care of his needs. And we're, God is good all the time. And uh, amen. You know, it's just one of those shotgun prayers. Just... Yada, 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 and it doesn't mean a thing. And I just, when I hear shotgun prayers, I think God has to be going, what, what do you want me to do? <laughs> do you want me to give him traveling mercies, or do you want me to heal him, or do you want me to cast demons? What do you want me to do? I don't, I don't know what to do. And so uh, shotgun prayers aren't really too, uh, too effective in the kingdom. And when James says, uh, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. I don't think he has shotgun prayers in mind. Uh, the, other, the other kind of prayer that does have, that is more effective and that does work better when we're praying with people and praying for people is, is more like a rifle uh, than a shotgun. And that's where there is a, a straight shot that it's aimed at a, at a target, the, a target that's been identified and that that shot is going to that target. Pray for one, when, when James says, pray for one another that you might be healed. That's a shotgun, or I mean, that's a, that's a rifle prayer. There's a specific target for what you're praying for. It's amazing how we can get into talking nice because we're afraid God might not answer. Amen? I, I mean, I've sat, uh, when I worked for the district office, I mean, all leaders, all pastors, all presbyters, all you know, and there was a prayer request sitting on our table. There's about 15 of us there, and we pray for people from all over the state. Uh, and this one was a person was was going to die. They needed healing, and people were praying shotgun prayers. It was just you know, Lord, just bless them, and Lord, just be with him today, and Lord, just you know, be with his family, and just be you know, and be there, and be here, and be there, and be here, and and it just something inside of me just. Uh, He's there. <laughs> He's there. <laughs> you don't need to pray, God, be with him. He's with him. God, heal his body. Lord, this brother has cancer. Jesus, dissolve that cancer. That's a rifle prayer, see, not a shotgun prayer. We don't have to pray for God to be with anybody. He's, he's there. It's a waste of breath. Pray for what you're asking for. Ask the Lord to do something. And so this, this is a, a kind of a, uh, a rifle approach, I think. And James is using it. Pray for one another that you might be healed. It's intentional. And he says this kind of prayer is effective. It avails much. Uh, in the King James, uh, that phrase at the end of verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We get excited about that, that part of the verse, you know. <laughs> we like that because we, you know, uh, we, we start shaking and we start yelling and we start binding and we start loosing and we start standing. And someone says, well, what are you doing? Ah, I'm being effectual and I'm being fervent and I'm being, you know. And, <laughs> and that, you know, that's all great. But, but I, is it working? Oh, I don't know. I'm too busy being effectual and being fervent and being, you know. Uh, so, well, maybe, I don't know. Um, Maybe that's not what he's saying. In fact, if you listen to some other translations from the, uh, besides King James, you might get a little more clear picture of what James is saying. He says, for example, in the NIV, he says, 
The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Uh, in the Revised Standard says, the prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. In the Amplified Version, it says, the prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. And so the, the emphasis is on two things. It's on, it's on who you are that is praying, a righteous man, a righteous woman. In other words, uh, a person of the Spirit, a man or a woman of, of God. That's, that's what we're about in, in, in these classes. The things that I've been talking to you about for 22 weeks on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, that, that we become men and women of, of righteousness, men and women who are truly men and women of God. And James is saying when a man or a woman of God prays, there is amazing power in that person's prayer. And I'm encouraging you, James says, I am encouraging you to pray for one another because you are people of the Spirit, and if you will pray for one another that you be healed, then God's going to start healing, and God's going to start doing something. It's effectual. It, is, it, has, it has effect. It has power to it. And so what it comes down to is that when God's people, when men and women of God uh, pray for one another, whether it's in a church service at the altar or it's one of the reasons why in altar calls, guys, I, I like to have you come and pray because I, I want you to get the message and I want the people of this church to get the message that it's not Pastor Lee, it's us. It's the men and women of God. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or the prayer of a righteous man, the prayer of a righteous woman avails much, has power, has dynamic to it. And so if I say, you know, if I have an altar call and then I say, some of you come up and just lay hands on these people, that's what I'm trying to do because God, wa God wants to use you just, you know, and, and so that's, that's it. Maybe it's at the altar. Maybe it's in somebody's living room. Maybe it's out in the parking lot or in a, hus a hospital room. But wherever it is, if you will pray, then your prayer becomes that vessel through which the power of God and the gifts of the Holy Spirit can do a mighty work in somebody's life. Praise the Lord. That's what James is saying in this passage. And so pray, pray for one another because prayer works. Because prayer works. Praise God. Now what I want to share with you tonight <clears throat> is a way or a process for ministering to somebody in prayer. And so this is a real practical uh, kind of teaching tonight. Uh, a, a little bit about methodology. A little bit about how to go about ministry in prayer. It's a process that makes our prayer for one another more effective. Less shotgun, more rifle. <laughs> and and less, less general and more tuned into the spirit, into the person that you're praying for. Uh, this process isn't original with me. Uh, the, the, the one who designed it or wrote it in the beginning was, was uh, well, it comes from the kingdom, but, but John Wimber, who was, uh, led a movement called the Vineyard Movement. Have you heard John Wimber or the Vineyard Churches? John was a beautiful man. He was a, he, some of you remember back to the rock and roll group called the Everly Brothers. Anybody remember the Everly Brothers? Well, John was a member of that group, and he was a rock star, and God just saved him, used his wife to bring him to Jesus. And he, he was kind of dragged into the ministry. His, his wife was an amazing woman, and he got kind of drug into it. But um, very beautiful, humble man, um, unusual man, very intelligent man, but used by God in hundreds and hundreds of healings. Uh, and deliverances, casting demons out of people. Uh, incredible evangelist and teacher, just a beautiful man of God. Um, and he taught this process of ministering prayer uh, to an Assembly of God pastor who, who I knew years ago. His name was uh, Richard Exley from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Richard pastored a church there, and 
he came up, having learned this process from Wimber, he came up to Minnesota one, one time, and our district uh, was having a pastor's retreat, and Richard did uh, a session on ministering prayer. And, and uh, it, it, it's something that, that is, I think, powerful. Uh, uh, I was in that session, and, and I learned, and I took notes, and I've used it all my life, and it works it's effective, it's biblical, it's spirit-led, it's the way Jesus ministered to people when he prayed for people. Uh, it, people get healed, people get saved, people get delivered uh, by going through this, this process. It happens more. And so I, I, I just believe in it very strongly, and I want to share it with you tonight. Uh, I learned it about 127 years ago, and it still works. Uh, but I want to share it with you because anybody who loves God can do it. It's not... It's not brain surgery, and it's not magic, and it's not, you don't have to be a special anything. You just have to be a man or a woman of God. And if you love Jesus and you're walking with Jesus, then you can do what I'm about to teach you. And I, and I, wanna, and I wanna show you how to do this. So let me set up the scene. Um, someone comes to you with a need, and they have asked you to pray for them. Pretty simple, happens all the time. And instead of just grabbing their hands and going at it, there's a process that you could go through that might make your prayers a little bit more effective. And you may see God answer more prayers if you'll do this. And so to begin with, let's just take a look at what Jesus did. Go over in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And would someone read for us verses 29 to 34, please? Matthew 20, 30, or 29 to 34. Just take a look at the first thing that Jesus did. This is the situation. These two blind men are, are crying out, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, thou son of David. The first thing that Jesus did is the first thing that you need to do when someone comes to you and says, would you pray for me? The very first thing that Jesus did was he stopped. He stopped. Jesus, I love the King James the best. It says, Jesus stood still. Jesus stopped what he was doing. He was on his way. He was leaving Jericho, and there was all kinds of people around, and Jesus stopped. And this is the first step to effective ministering prayer. Get off of your agenda and get onto their agenda. That's what happened. Jesus just stopped, and he listened. Someone comes to us for prayer, and we, in our busy, hectic lives, are, are uh, you know, we, it's not that we don't want to help, it's that we want to just try to fit it into where we're going and what we're doing, and, and so we get into kind of a crusader mode, and we, <laughs> we don't even know what the real need is, uh, but we just start praying. But Jesus stopped, and he does this in many situations. Jesus stopped, and he began to just talk with these blind men. Um, Wimber called it the interview, <laughs> uh, and just, just talking with them, asking them some questions. Uh, and he said, what, what is it that you want me to do for you? Now, that, that seems like kind of a dumb question, really, because they've been crying out. Obviously, they're blind. Help us, have mercy on us. Yeah, of course, of course, you could assume that they wanted their sight back, but 
Maybe they wanted money. Maybe they, who knows? And Jesus doesn't assume anything. Jesus stops and he asks a question. What would you have me, what do you want me to pray for you about? And this is a great first question. In fact, I think the best question that you can ask somebody when you're in this situation is, what would you like for Jesus to do for you? Not me. What would you like me to do for you? No. What would you like Jesus to do for you? Now, probably about eight times out of ten, that's going to shock people. They haven't really thought about that. Most people just want prayer. They really don't know what for. They don't quite know what they want God to do for them. And, and many times people come with needs. They're in crisis. They're in pain. And they just say, well, pray for me. Pray for me. They haven't really thought through what it is they want God to do. What would, what would it look like if we prayed and God answered the prayer? What would life look like for you after that prayer? And so by stopping and asking to just, what, what are your expectations from the Lord in this? It's a great place to start. Many times the initial thing that people come to prayer for, and this is very important, the initial thing that people come to prayer for isn't really the need, isn't really the issue. How many have noticed that? Psychologists call this the presenting problem. <laughs> And most of the time, the presenting problem isn't the real problem. The presenting problem is just what's hurting at the time. It's, it's the crisis of the moment. It's the tyranny of the urgent, but there's reasons why I'm in pain right now. There's, there's root causes and there's root issues that you can treat symptoms all day long, but until you get to the root of it, you're just going to keep treating symptoms. And so by just stopping... And, and saying, well, let's talk about this. For, before we just jump in and start praying and asking God you know, to heal your headache, where's that headache coming from? And let's, let's, uh, let's stop that. Uh, uh, let, let's start that. Now, you begin to discern what the real issue is. And the reason why this is important, I've spent 22 weeks talking to you about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit can do. Here is where you give the Holy Spirit a chance to give you a word of knowledge, to give you uh, the discerning of spirits, and you realize this, is, this thing is demonically empowered, or a word of wisdom that, that, that just is something you speak, and it just helps them to see their situation in a different, from a different perspective. Uh, it's, it's a chance for, by stopping and listening Rather than just jumping right in and starting talking to God, it gives God a chance to talk to you and give you some help in ministering to this person. How, and, and, and you, as you're listening to the person, listen to the Lord. God, how would you have me pray for this person? What, what is the thing that we need to focus on here? And, and that's, that's huge. That's huge. That's a very important first step. Um, and that leads to the next step, but does anybody have any questions about the first step? <laughs> stop and listen. That's what Jesus did. Just stop and listen. Ask a couple questions before you dive right in. The second step is to, um, and these aren't necessarily the best ways to talk about it, but just it's, it's helpful. Identify your target. Identify your target. And you do this not alone. Don't do this alone. Do it together with the person you're going to pray for. What, you, the both of you, the two of you together agree, this is what we're going to pray for. This is what we're going to, we're going to go to the Lord with. Let's say someone comes to you, uh, you're in a small group, and at the end of the small group, end of the meeting, uh, they, they say something, oh, I've just been having tremendous pain in my stomach, and it's I just don't know. Would you, would you pray for me that God would just heal me? I, I've taken everything I can take. I've just got terrible pain in my stomach. And, and you know, the, the natural response would be, okay, God, just touch my brother's stomach, my sister's stomach. But instead of praying, you, you might just ask a question like, how long has this pain been going on? 
oh man, I've just been sick in my stomach for two months and it just hurts and I just, I, I can't eat. I can't, it's just I, for a couple months now. Well, ask the next question. What's been going on in your life for the last two months? <laughs> you know? Ah, well, let's see. Uh, last two months. Uh, well, Johnny ran away from home and my husband is going to lose his job next week and our bank account is $2,000 overdrawn and we don't know where the money is. And, we, and, and pastor just asked me to teach a class on the joy of the Lord. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and so you had all this stuff going on for the last two months and you've had this pain in your stomach for the last two months. What do you want to pray for? What do you want to ask God to do? Because the person comes asking for prayer for a stomach ache, but by stopping and listening, it becomes obvious to both of you that the stomach ache is a symptom of some pretty heavy duty stress. And so, you know what? Maybe let's pray that God will just come right now and give you peace in the midst of this storm that you're in. And that He can give you release from worry and from fear and from anxiety. And let's ask God to do miracles of, of grace to help in each one of these situations. Let's pray about your husband and pray about Johnny and let's, let's do that. But I bet if God does those kinds of things, your stomach ache's going to go away. And so you've, you've just kind of helped to identify how it is that the two of you are going to agree in prayer. And take the time to do that. Be just that alone, guys. Just doing that alone. You have ministered to that person more in just that little conversation than, than someone who takes months and months and months sitting in a counseling office and praying for stomach and going to doctors and going to this and doing that and taking that pill. You're going to do a lot more by just stopping and helping you and that person and the Holy Spirit come up with, this is, these are the things that we need God to help us with. This is what we're going to bring to the Lord. And just that, you'll watch that person go, you know, even right then, their stomach is going to begin to go away because now I get it. It connects and I know what I can bring to the Lord. And you're going to see change right there. And so before you shoot... Agree on what the target is. <laughs> Identify the target. <laughs> okay? Any, any questions on that? You see, this is simple. Anybody can do this. It's not brain surgery. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Steve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yep, and, and that's, the, that's kind of the neat thing about it is that the person that you're praying for is actually, uh, you know, engaged in the process too. You know, they're, they're thinking about it and they're looking at it and, and God can speak to them just as easily as he can speak to you, you know, and, and, and you're in this together and you're ministering then. You're really serving this person rather than just, you know, going through a religious act. So stop and listen and then identify the target. Number three is choose your weapon. Choose your weapon. Uh, now, this requires us uh, to be familiar with our prayer arsenal. And, and you know that there's more than one type of prayer, right? 
There's more than, there's a lot of different kinds of prayer and ways to pray and different things. Paul said uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons, plural, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so the question here is, which weapon is the right one for the target that we've identified? Now that we know how, what it is, the, what the real need is or what we're going to pray for, how do we need to pray? And that's a very important question. For example, let's say you are, you are with a, a couple and their son is into drugs and they're running from God. They, they raised him the best that they could but went a different way and he's on, on you know, drugs now and he's running away from home and he's just, he's a mess and the, you're sitting with that mom and that dad, and they're just broken, and, and, and uh, they want you to pray with them about Johnny. Well, you might join them with intercessory prayer, that you join with them and intercede for Johnny together, and you stand in the gap so that the Holy Spirit has that connection to Johnny. That's what intercession is. Intercession is that you place yourself in a position where God can work and God can do a work in the life of somebody who's not praying themselves, who's not seeking God themselves. Intercession is you putting yourself in that gap so that the Lord can use you to touch that person and to do that work. And so mom and dad have been praying and they just need help. And so you come alongside of them and you pray and encourage them, but then the three of you intercede for Johnny and you stand in the gap for that young man. And God uses you to reach that young man. Um, so intercession is, is one way uh, to do that. You, you may say something like, you know, we're going to pray together for him right now, but, but then uh, let's continue to pray every week. Let's get together on Tuesday afternoon or whatever, and let's, let's just take some time and intercede for Johnny. And, and I'll come and meet with you, and, and, and we're just going to pray for a half hour a day or whatever it is, and just continue to intercede. Until, and the reason why that's important, I think, is because it takes time, having gone through it myself as a parent, and a lot of you guys have too, it takes a long time for God to work through all those defenses and all of those walls and all of the dumb choices that they made and all the predicaments that they've gotten themselves in. It takes time for God to work through all that stuff. And so intercession isn't something you just do once and walk away from. It's, it's, that, it's a war. It's a battle. You're fighting for that person's life because that person isn't praying for themselves. They need somebody to do it for them. And so you, you, you do that and you intercede. Um, maybe it's a need for physical healing. And, and then uh, you pray a prayer of supplication. You ask. Jesus says in... In fact, uh, let's go over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. And would someone read verses 7 through 12, please, of Matthew 7? So, and so asking, bringing your needs before the Lord. Paul talks about this in Philippians 4, uh, with everything in prayer and, and, and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. And so you bring that, uh, bring that need to the Lord and you ask for it to be filled. Now, sometimes during your time of, of stopping and listening, uh, perhaps the Lord gives you a, a, a a word, of, a word of knowledge, that this illness, and, and perhaps you, you know, the person has come for healing, but you recognize by the Spirit that this illness is a result of a satanic attack. 
it's demonic, it's, it's, it's an attack of the devil, then your weapon isn't asking. And your weapon isn't intercession necessarily. Your weapon becomes a faith command in the name of Jesus Christ. Stop this attack. We cut off this attack. You take authority over Satan. If God leads you to do that, then you do that. And that's a weapon in your arsenal is that, that faith command. Uh, there's, there's intercession. There's asking the Lord. Just like a, a child asks the Father for, for, for a gift, a gift of healing. But, but if, the, if the Holy Spirit says this is more than just a need for a gift, this is an attack. This is war. You are entering into a battle. Then you pray the prayer of faith, a, a faith command where you take authority over Satan. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And, and so you take it to him. And so you may wind up casting a demon out of a person. Uh, you, you may wind up, uh, the, the sickness is healed, uh, but it, it, it's different than the gift of healing. It's actually a result of victory over, over the devil. And they're healed because you won the fight. <laughs> God won the fight. Amen. Go ahead, Freddie. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, the Holy Spirit might show you, and again, this is again where the gifts of the Spirit are used, you know, in this ministering prayer. He might show you that this sickness is a result of sin in this person's life. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know something. Now, let me show you, share something about that with you. Let's say that the person has unforgiveness towards someone or a root of bitterness. A root of bitterness will kill you physically. It'll kill you. Uh, unforgiveness will kill you. you know, it'll do stuff to your liver. It'll do stuff to your stomach. It'll do stuff to your intestines. It'll, your heart, it'll kill you. Uh, I don't think the Bible is being nebulous or spiritual when it talks about that. And when Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 11... And he says that you're taking communion unworthily and you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself and many are sick and many are dying because there's a root there that needs to be repented of and changed. And so if you sense this, that the reason for the person's sickness or the reason for the trial or the calamity or whatever it is that you're praying about, you sense that the reason is because of sin in their own lives. And it could be. But here's where most people really muck it up. <laughs> it's, oh, the Holy Spirit shows me that you have hidden sin in your life and you need to repent and you need... If you want to throw up walls, do that. <laughs> if you want to stop the prayer meeting, do that. You know, get accusatory. Get judgmental. Tell them all. You know, that, that'll stop it right now and you'll never minister to that person again. So don't be stupid about it. Ask the person. You've been having a conversation. You've already identified what you're going to pray for. And you're seeing something. You're sensing something. Ask them a question. You can say something like, is there anyone in your life, maybe it happened in your past, somebody who really hurt you, and you haven't been able to forgive them? Maybe it's something that you did and you, and you haven't been able to forgive yourself. Talk to me about that. Someone who wronged you. Something that happened to you. And you've, you, you, it's in your heart and, and, and the anger that's there, the resentment or whatever, and you just ask them. Don't accuse them. You want them to be healed. And when we accuse people, even of hidden sin, Jesus, with the woman on the well, he didn't accuse her. He, had, he knew exactly what was going on in her life, and he just had a conversation with her. And she was honest about, well, the guy that I'm with now, yeah, you, you know, the guy that you're with now, you're not married to. In fact, you, you know, and he just has a conversation with her, and it wasn't accusatory. And in fact, she opens her heart to him, and then she goes and tells her friends and her family, you got to come talk to this guy. And you can be the same way in ministering to people. Just, just deal with that first. You know what? 
before we pray any more about, about healing your, your, your body, can we just take some time and pray about, about this first? And if you need to give that to Jesus, if it's bitterness, you need, to, you need to give that to the Lord. I bet you if you could forgive that person, I bet you if you could repent of that sin that you did and ask forgiveness for that, that your symptoms, your physical symptoms would go away. I bet that it happened. And even if it doesn't happen, we're going to pray for your healing. Don't worry. We're going to pray for your healing. But there's something more here that needs to be healed as well. And you can have a conversation like that with somebody and, and in love and minister to that person and they're going to open their heart and they're going to tell you, yeah, I, I did this. I, I did that. I, I was, uh, that happened to me or whatever it is. And you can deal with that first and then go back and, and pray for you know, the physical symptoms. But many, 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 many physical symptoms are the result of, of, of a root that's deeper than that that needs to be uh, dealt with. And so uh, I think, just it's my personal opinion, but I, I, I happen to think that many people are not healed. You know, and that comes up a lot. What, Pastor, why, why doesn't everybody, why, why does God heal everybody who gets prayed for? I think that a lot of times people aren't healed because the root and the reason for their disease has never been dealt with. And, and, and the root and the reason for the disease has nothing to do with the physical manifestation. There's a spiritual issue. There's an emotional issue. There's an abuse issue. There's anger. There's, there's bitterness. There's something underneath there that is, hasn't been forgiven, that won't be admitted, that won't be dealt with, that, that keeps being skirted. And as long as that's there, that person will never have physical healing. And it's not that God doesn't want to. It's that God can't. Because you've got to deal with the root before you can deal with the, with the plant. That's just my opinion, but I, I've been around for a little while, and, I, and I've seen it too many times to know that that's not, not true. So take time when you're ministering to people in prayer and, and, and help them to get to the root of, of their problem and, and really pray. If you want to be effective and, and see somebody healed. So God has given us this amazing arsenal of weapons of our warfare. And, and, and we need to just take a minute. And it doesn't take very long. The more you, the more you study the, the, the word of God and the more you pray and the more you get to understand what your arsenal is, what's available to you at your fingertips, fingertips then it doesn't take very long to decide how you need to proceed, what kind of prayer you need to pray. Uh, that comes pretty fast. I know I need to rebuke Satan here. I know I need to intercede here. Um, and uh, whatever it is, but, but you choose your weapons. Any, any questions or comments about choosing your weapons? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that something? Wow. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Barb? Oh, man. Yeah, and, and that's why James says in this passage, confess your sins and pray for one another. You might be healed. That's, that's, that's what he's talking about. It's deal with the root, and you'll see you know, that the physical manifestation will be there. Doesn't mean they're all that way, but when they are, you've got to deal with them. You've got to do it. 
So, after having done those three things, then the, the fourth step in this process is it's time to pray. It's a good idea to pray. <laughs> but let me just emphasize again, that's not the time to start shaking them and getting all fervent and sweaty. You, know? you don't need to do that and go on all King James on them. You just, just <laughs> when you're praying for people, dial down again, because as you are praying... And as you're ministering, the Holy Spirit is still at work. Steve, what you said is very important. This is God's work. This is the Lord doing this. You're, you, you can't heal anybody. You can't deliver anybody. You can't, you can't fix anything in anybody's life. You can't. I can't. But as you're praying, listen. Listen, listen, listen. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Uh, you're, you're using this weapon and, and, and just listen and watch. Uh, you know, again, don't get on your agenda when you pray. Stay on their agenda, stay on God's agenda. And one of the ways that I do that is I keep my eyes open. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but I just notice that if I'm praying for somebody that way, I keep my eyes open for a couple of reasons. Number one, I, I, if, if, if I see, you're, I'm praying for somebody and they're all, you know, you know then I'm going to just stop. And I'm going to say, you know what? I just want you to relax. I just want you to receive. You don't have to f earn this, you know? You don't have to earn this. You don't have to, you're all tensed up. Look at your shoulders are up. You know, you look like, a Minnesotan <laughs> in January. <laughs> uh, you just, just you know, you you just you just relax. I want you to receive from the Lord. You don't have to work for this. Jesus is in charge of this thing, and so it might be good. Everyone, just pay attention to what's going on. Um, if they're not paying attention, and this one drives me crazy. You know, I, I mean, I'm trying to take their needs seriously. And I'm trying to minister to them, and then I'm praying for them, and they're looking around and, you know, well, then I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's not that important to you, then I'm wasting my time. So, but sometimes that's just a disconnect that happens, that, that, that because of old religion, okay, the priest is doing his thing now, something like that. Uh, and so sometimes... If that's going on, if they're not paying attention or if it's like they're checking out, stop and ask, what's going on? I just notice you're not, you're not bowing your head. You're not, you, you seem like you're just kind of waiting to get out of here. Do you need to go somewhere? And if they do, then let them go. You know what? Maybe we need to set up a time when we can meet and do this another time because you need to be somewhere and so... Let's just ask God to continue this and, and you go home or go get your kid or whatever you need to do. Um, sometimes there's more that needs to be revealed. And you feel like you're ready to pray, but maybe there's something else that they need to tell you. There's another shoe that needs to drop and they're embarrassed or they're they know that you're doing your best, but there's more information here that needs. And so be aware of that. Say, you know, is there something else that you need to tell me? Is there something, you know, I mean, I just feel like you're not engaged here very much. Is there, what's going on? Try not to use the word why, because why is a, is a, a word that immediately brings defenses. Why? What do you mean? I have to explain myself, you know. It just causes people to be def de defensive. And so use instead the word what. What's, what's going on? I just noticed that I'm praying here and your eyes are open and you're looking around the room and, and, and kind of like you're not really interested or, not, or maybe I'm doing, am I doing something wrong? Just try to serve them. Find out what's going on. But that's very important to do because... Um, uh, Again, we're, we're trying to, to be effective in our ministry, not just go through religious perfunctory emotions. And let the Holy Spirit guide you in that because that could be the very thing. I mean, that's the trigger that could really change things. The other shoe that drops is the real, the real deal. And the Holy Spirit is working in this person's heart 
and conviction is going on, and now it's time to get real. And the Lord will use you to do that. And so uh, uh, if, you're, if you're ministering to somebody that way and they're not tuning in, find out what's going on. Find out what's going on. Uh, does that make sense to you guys? Have you ever ha experienced that before where somebody just tuned out? Boy, I just, I think, well, what are we doing here? Let's go eat pizza, you know? But sometimes it's because they have something they need to tell you and they're not sure they should say it, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, be do that. Now, along with this, uh, the, the, the whole idea that it's time to pray, um, it's also in this, in this particular point, uh, we, you, need to, you need to pray through. Uh, and that's an old uh, Pentecostal phrase. comes back from the year of, the, the years, oh, Pastor Nancy and Steve were just little kids. Back in Azusa Street, 1914. No, 1901. Huh? Back in the 80s. Back in the 80s? 1880s. <laughs> but praying through means that it might not all happen in one pop. And again, this is about ministering in prayer, and ministering in prayer is about a commitment to this, to this person until God answers. And so it's the same situation we talked about earlier where if we're going to really intercede for a, a, a son who's away from God, it may take more than one time getting together and praying. It may be a commitment to meet once a week or whatever and praying with that person. And again, here... You know, maybe it's Sunday morning at the altar and you've prayed for somebody for a couple of minutes, but their family's waiting and, and you, you really didn't get a chance to really engage in the process that I'm talking about and, and just set up a time to meet again and keep that ministry going and keep that prayer going. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of, you know, in our culture today, time is more important than money and people are just have a lot of things going on. And so don't be afraid uh, don't, don't feel like, you know, unless we get this all settled right now, we failed God. No, just set up a time and get together again and keep going. Keep going and keep going until you pray it through, until you feel a release and they feel a re release. God, the answer is here or the answer is on its way. I, I, I can just stand now. I don't need to keep asking. I don't need to keep wrestling. I, I know God has this. And when that happens, you have prayed through, and boy, there's just peace in that. There's strength in that. There's victory in that. There's hope in that. And, and it gives the Holy Spirit a chance to work. And so pray through. Don't, don't give up. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the fourth step is just we've got to pray. We've got to do it and commit to it. And then the fifth step, and this is an extremely important step. Wimber um, called this... Um, post-prayer council. Post-prayer council. Now, he didn't invent it. Jesus does it when he prays for people. Uh, and it is very important when you're, when you're ministering uh, in prayer with people. Many times, Jesus uh, would speak to a person after he healed them or cast a demon out of them, and he would talk to them about two things. He talked to them about what just happened to them, and then he would, uh, he would talk to them about how not to get into that predicament again, and that's very important. Uh, John 5 is an example of that, but you can see it many times in Jesus' ministry. He heals a paralytic man, and later on, that, I don't know if it was that day or the next day, but it just says afterwards... He found that same man in the temple, the Bible says. He found him in the temple, and he said to him, Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So when you listen to those words from Jesus, if we go back over our five-step process, somewhere in there, Jesus discerned that this man was paralyzed because of something that he did to himself something he was involved in, a sin in his life. And we talked about that. And he prays for him and he heals him. But he says, look, you need to change your ways or you're going to be right back here again. 
And boy, does that ever happen in our culture today? <laughs> ever been with an alcoholic? <laughs> Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. That was post-prayer counsel. And this is something that, that we can do as well. It's one thing to be healed. It's another thing to stay healed. It's one thing to be set free. It's another, another thing to stay set free. And we need to, there, there are things that we need to change in our lives. If there are things that need to change in our lives, then we need to do those things in order to stay free or stay healed or stay sober or any of those kinds of things. You've got to, to change some things in your life. And so this post-prayer counsel is um, talking with that person and helping them so that they don't fall back into old habits, old thought patterns, old attitudes that got them into trouble to begin with. Now, if... If it's something that, you know, I mean, maybe you're not comfortable doing that. And, and that's, that's fine. Uh, but don't just pray and walk away. Um, just if someone needs further help and you don't feel like you're the one to do that, then refer them. Re call me, call Pastor Nancy, call, call uh, uh, one of, you know, someone who you know has the maturity that, that could help this person with the post-prayer counsel part of things. And just to follow up on that person, you know, is it okay if I, if I uh, uh, have uh, Dave give you a call? He, you know, you guys can just talk or whatever it is. But just something that helps them to get past uh, what, uh, what brought them into the predicament in the first place. And this is what post-prayer counsel is about. It's something that Jesus does quite often because the reality is, uh, and we've said this many, many times as we've walked through this, these, these teachings, is that, that um, this is a war. This is a battle. And when you're ministering to, to someone and, and you, get a, you get a win, you see someone healed or delivered or something changes or somebody gets reconciled or whatever it is, when you see those wins, don't think that the fight's over. Satan is going to try to get that territory back. He's not going to give up. Uh, and he's going to try to come in, and he'll use the old tricks. And if they don't work, he'll try new tricks. Uh, but some way, he wants that person back. And so if we're just aware of that as people of the Spirit, and that this truly is a war zone, and we truly are in a war, and we have a real enemy who is out to steal and to kill and to destroy then we need to do more than just pray and walk away. We need to pray and see God work and then say, now how could we help that person along so that they don't fall again? And this is, again, what James talks about in, in the, at the end of his passage uh, that we began, that, that if, you, if you literally snatch someone out of, out of a sinful pattern in their life, you've saved them. You've saved them. And so... Uh, this is, this is an important part of it, just uh, keeping Satan in his place. And so these are the, the, five, the, the five steps of this process of ministering to people in prayer. It's something that every, every man or woman of God can do. Hallelujah. It's a way to see spiritual gifts manifested in your life and in your ministry and in your relationships with brothers and sisters, with people who don't know God. It's a way for you to see the Spirit work. It's a way for us to begin to see more healings in this church than we've ever seen. Because it's not just somebody up here doing all of it. It's something that's just happening by course of relationship as we learn how to pray for one another in an effectual way, in a powerful way. And, and it's, it's something that, Je it's the way Jesus ministered and so if it's the way Jesus ministered, then it should be the highest priority for you and me in the way that we minister. Hallelujah. Praise God. Any questions or comments about it? Yes, Shanta.
Yeah. Right. Mm. That's huge. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that root went really, really, really deep. <laughs> Isn't that something? Praise God. Someone else, you have something you'd like to share? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Confidentiality, that's huge. You bet. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's, you know, why would we do that? Who, who cares? <laughs> you know, we all have our dirty laundry, and, you know, that's not, that's not what this is about. This is about exalting Jesus Christ and seeing him do his work. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Well, I just, yeah, I, I, I think it's good to do just because it's a process and, and, and there's people involved and there, the Spirit of God is involved. And it's great to pray with your eyes closed when, you're, when it's you and Jesus so that you're not distracted. But in this kind of prayer, it's not about you. It's about ministry. And so I'm serving this person. And so my eyes need to be open so that I can see if this person is reacting. I mean, um, and, you know, I mean, if you read anything of John Wimbers, he has a book called um, Power Healing that's just an amazing, amazing work. And he talks about how um, the Lord, sometimes when God was healing a person, um, in one particular instance, he was praying for someone who had cancer, and the cancer was demonically uh, empowered. It was a demon, and, and it, it, it was connected to the cancer. And as John was praying for the, the it was just sounds weird, but the, the cancer was literally moving all through this person's body, running, and, and John could see it. And there were times when just the skin would actually, where this, there was a demon manifesting, and finally they cast the demon out, uh, and the person was completely free of cancer, but it was a de demonically formed cancer. And, and so, he, you know, keep your eyes open because there's stuff going on, and you need to watch what's going on so that you can deal with what you're dealing with. And so, uh, so this is, again, this isn't a devotional type thing at all. This is ministry ministering in prayer to people and letting the Holy Spirit use you and seeing the gifts of God manifested in and through you and seeing the Lord uh, do what only He can do. We can't do it, but He sure can. And it's awesome when He does. Hallelujah. I believe that if we would just take the time and, and learn this and do this more, 
I, I truly believe this, guys. We would see more healings in this church. We would see more real deliverances in this church where people really do get set free from those old functions and junk in their lives and it doesn't come back in, in six months and three months and two weeks and, you know, whatever. But it's something that the Lord really breaks because, because it's gone beyond just that treating symptoms to really getting down to the root and tearing out those roots and, and casting them into the sea. Hallelujah. So take these notes. I think this is recorded, so if you want to get a copy of it and look at it some more and study about it some more and start implementing it in your life, uh, it'll, it'll be something that will really help you and, and God will use you. Jesus, we love you and we thank you so much that as we look at this exhortation to pray for one another, Lord, that you don't limit that to pastors or prophets or evangelists or anyone praying. It's, it's the body of Christ ministering to one another. And Jesus, we thank you for that, Lord. And so we enter into this and we ask that you would help us to truly capture what it means to pray for one another and to see the Spirit of God released in and through our prayer and doing those works that God only you can do. Lord Jesus, we pray that that ministering prayer would just be something that goes on around here, that, that just a part of how we relate to one another and that the beauty of it and the answered prayer and the healing and the, the changed lives can just be a part of the way things go at Riverside because you're with us and you love us and you want God's best for every person under this roof. And we thank you for it, Father. I ask you to continue to walk with us the rest of this week and use us for your glory. Cover our homes with the blood of Christ. Bless our kids and our grandkids, Lord, and just, Lord Jesus, we exalt you and we treasure you and we love you. And we yield ourselves just one more time uh, to be servants of the living God for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.